Morning, everyone, and welcome to the Penn Museum. I'm Julian Siggers, and I'm the Williams Director here at the museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first speaker in this year's great lecture series on great catastrophes. As we are now in the final weeks of our monumental renovations, I'm really hoping the only catastrophes left are for this series. <laughs> I do hope you'll join us on November 16th and 17th for our opening weekend celebration. Um, the galleries are looking spectacular. For those of you who've seen our new galleries of the, of the Middle East, this is, these are our new galleries of Africa and Mexico and Central America, and I'm absolutely thrilled with them. Of course, when you enter our new fully restored entranceway, the first thing that you will see is our Sphinx of Ramses II, which uh, moved with some fanfare across the museum this summer. So I look forward to seeing you all then. It always gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker, uh, a good colleague and friend of mine. Dr. Steve Tinney wears many hats here at the museum. He's the deputy director of the museum. He's the chief curator, head of collections and research, and director of the Center for the Analysis of Archaeological Material and associate curator in charge of the Babylonian section. And since that doesn't seem to keep him busy, he's also the Clark Research Associate Professor of Assyriology in Penn's Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department and the director of the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve received his bachelor's degree in Assyriology from Cambridge University and his doctorate from the University of Michigan. In addition to the Syrian, Sumerian Dictionary Project, which he first joined as a postdoctoral research assistant over 20 years ago, his research interests include the literary and intellectual history of ancient Mesopotamia and a wide range of efforts to bring digital approaches to the study of the ancient Near East to, to greater publics. Steve will be discussing the Great Flood and its aftermath. I hope you'll be able to join us for a range of catastrophes this year. <laughs> Up next will be Kathleen Morrison and Emily Hammer, who will discuss using archaeology to improve climate change models. And in December, the series will be moving back to the fully renovated Harrison Auditorium, uh, which looks fantastic and is, for the first time in its history, now air-conditioned as well as renovated. <laughs> which is <laughs> But in the interim, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Steve. Okay, the first question on is, is my mic on? Uh, it just seems to me that this is gonna be a year of non-stop catastrophe jokes, right? <laughs> like, I hope my lecture isn't a catastrophe, uh, for example. Um, well, thank you all for coming. It's a great turnout to kick off the season. Um, the Great Flood and its aftermath. The Great Flood is probably one of the most famous things in uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, this shot is a gallery shot from a few years ago. In fact, everything seems like a few years ago, but it's four years ago now when we had a small special exhibit for the Pope's visit to Philadelphia. And the flood tablet was one of its stars. And this is what we still lovingly call the flood tablet, the Sumerian flood tablet, although as you'll see, it's not quite true anymore. Um, it's not a catastrophe, though. We should have a, a swear jar for every speaker who uses the word catastrophe too many times in their talk, right? Because it's going to be overdone. You know it's going to be overdone. Um, so. I know many of you are old hands, many of you know some of this, but I'm going to start off just by orienting you in time and space. Uh, we are in the Middle East tonight, and we are particularly in uh, what is now Iraq. Um, and we're looking at materials, written materials, primarily from these cities in the south, Ur and Nippur and Sippar, and also up here in the north from Nineveh, where there's a very, very important ancient library that was collected by a king called Ashurbanipal around 650 BCE, and a number of the tablets you see will be from that library. 
Um, we're going to cover quite a time range, not as much as I sometimes do, actually, because it turns out that flood stories in cuneiform culture, in ancient Mesopotamian culture, don't really come in until after around 2000 BCE. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't exist before. They may or may not have, but we don't have them. So tonight, we're only going to be covering about 1,500 years of time, okay? But I'll try to keep that all clear as we move forwards. And I'll explain a bit more about Sumerian and Akkadian and cuneiform as we go along, rather than do it all up front. So one of the reasons the flood is so well known in Mesopotamia is that it's a tremendous part of the consciousness of some of the great world religions, right? There's a version of it in the Hebrew Bible, which was translated into Greek and into Latin. Uh, this is from the Gutenberg text, the beautiful front page. And one of the things you'll see as we go through this evening is I'm going to use a lot of very beautiful uh, medieval through Victorian uh, illustrations, imaginations of the flood. And up here, oops, up here is the part where, um, God, this is chapter 7, uh, God says to Noah, take you your, and all of your household into the ark, right? And many people who are familiar with either Christianity or Islam know this material. Um, as I just intimated, it, there's a, a version of the flood story, the Noah story, a Noah narrative in the Quran, and both the Old Testament versions and the Quranic versions serve different purposes than the Mesopotamian ones I'm going to discuss. I'm not going to discuss those in detail. Um, if you want to try asking some questions, I may or may not uh, pretend to know enough to answer them. It's not really my field of expertise, but it's such a fascinating topic. The flood is something I always teach in my undergraduate classes because it goes on and on. It's not only in the Abrahamic religions, but it also is very much part of the medieval imagination. It features in uh, a number of histories of the world, including this fantastic 15th century one that's actually in the Penn Libraries and was featured in the Sacred Writings exhibit when the Pope came with this beautiful drawing of how the Ark was imagined to be. You see, Arca Noe, Noah's Ark, right? And there are, there's a flood story in one or two Latin authors as well, or classical authors as well. Uh, Ovid includes it in his Metamorphoses, and it's not quite the same, but there's lots of moments in it that are reminiscent of either the version in the, in the Old Testament, or which has a lot of similarities with the, with the um, Mesopotamian versions, and it almost appeared in a book. There's a lost Caxton translation of the Metamorphoses into English, and this happens to be a manuscript which uh, we believe was derived from that book. So once you get things put into books, obviously they become practically mass items compared to individual manuscripts, right? So the upshot is that the flood story was known by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people over time in one way or another. Tremendous part of the sort of human consciousness, if you like. And then I discovered this in my extensive Google research for this paper, as you do. <laughs> And I couldn't stop myself using it. This is a 1927 National Guard poster. Um, well, I don't know if the poster, the picture is from 1927, but it's referencing the 1927 Mississippi floods, where the, the guard planes uh, spotted numbers of people and helped in their, in their uh, rescue. And it's the Great Flood of 1927. The Great Flood is one of those images that we carry with us and project into the future. And for sure, if we watch the newspapers and the media, uh, we'll see it again, right? So what about the Mesopotamian story? What's up with that? Where does it come from? What does it consist of? How do we have it? Um, this gentleman, George Smith, is one of the reasons we have it. He was one of the mid-19th century Assyriologists who worked on the materials from Nineveh and actually found fragments which he identified as part of uh, what we now call the Gilgamesh myth which he called Isdubar, um, but a very smart guy. He's working about 20 years after cuneiform had been deciphered, and he immediately recognized the importance of this and actually persuaded the Daily Telegraph to send another expedition back to the site of Nineveh to find more pieces of the, fro of the broken tablets he had found. Um, and this is one such 
tablet that had been broken into pieces, he actually did find more fragments of it. And in 1872, presented it at a scholarly meeting, and 1874, published it as the 11th tablet of the Isdubar legend. And we still call it Gilgamesh 11. So he was really a pioneer. And you can imagine what a tremendous uh, furor this caused, because you have an entire Victorian culture centered around the Bible and the Old Testament, and suddenly you have these weird and wonderful uh, cuneiform tablets which look like nothing on earth, written by people who are mentioned in the Bible, the Assyrians, right? And telling us a tale, a narrative, that to all intents and purposes also occurs in the Old Testament. So that really put Assyriology on the map. It made Assyriology uh, what it was for the first 30 or 40 years, which was basically in the service of biblical studies. And it took that amount of time before it became a much more independent academic or intellectual enterprise. And without apologizing, I'm gonna focus on Mesopotamia tonight. Uh, but as I say, ask me questions about the other stuff if you want. So this is one form of Gilgamesh. Um, this is from about 650 BC from Ashurbanipal's library. Oh, wrong way. Um, here's the, the better known tablet. Um, you see a lot of pictures of this. It's also basically the same text. Uh, the scribes wrote multiple copies of this. Uh, one of the interesting things we're learning as we understand more about the intellectual history of Mesopotamia is that in fact, it's not very common to write complete sets of things like Gilgamesh. So although probably there were some in Ashurbanipal's library, which was large and very atypical, most people didn't probably own a complete set. So when we talk about the whole story, we're talking partly about things that people knew and partly about what they wrote. The Gilgamesh flood story goes back to an earlier one from a composition that we call simply Atrahasis, after the name of the person who features most prominently in it. He's the flood survivor. Atrahasis means exceedingly wise. And I'll come back to this a bit later. There are several different names for the flood survivor, but they all have to do with understanding the ways of the god Enki, or Ea, who's the god of magic and wisdom and helps humanity in various ways. And these three tablets, as you are looking at here, although they look like more to you, are actually an incredibly precious thing because they were originally the whole Atrahasis story written on three tablets by one person, one scribe, okay? And this is here, tablet one. This is in the British Museum. This is the only remaining fragment of tablet two. It's possible there are others out there in collections that haven't been identified, but I doubt it. This one actually is in the Morgan Library in New York. And this is tablet three, and this big piece is in the British Museum, and this little piece, which ju just about joins it, fits where it touches, uh, is actually in Geneva. Um, and this is actually not uncommon for tablets uh, excavated or uh, dug up by uh, local villagers in the 1870s when the British Museum were buying tablets on the market and the Louvre was buying them and there were collectors here buying them. And sometimes the fragments get separated and there are a number of such joins. Uh, we have pieces in our collection which if we were to rejoin them would go together with pieces in the Louvre in Paris or in the, in the Berlin Museums or in the British Museum. Um, but what this means is that we have kind of, although it's very incomplete, as you can see, we have kind of a snapshot of the Atrahasis story. And it features the flood as part of it. So I'm going to put that into context as we work our way through. This is just a late piece of Atrahasis, just to make the point that Atrahasis actually has a version from about 1600 or so, and versions that go all the way down through to about 650 or so in Ashurbanipal's library. And one of the interesting things is the flood story occurs in Atrahasis and it occurs in Gilgamesh. And the same people have these two tales in their heads, but they don't see them as mutually exclusive. They're just different parts of the same tradition. Yeah? And what you're looking at here, just to explain the cuneiform a little more. So cuneiform is a writing system um, which is made by impressing a stylus onto clay. And it makes these triangular shapes on the clay and we draw these shapes as triangular outlines uh, to help people read them. This fragment here is actually just this piece down here. Uh, this tablet is, has several pieces that, that join, as you're becoming used to, right? 
And cuneiform is used for a handful of languages. Um, there are only two that I'm really going to deal with today. One is Sumerian. That's the language, uh, my research specialty. Um, it's the best language, right? Um, it's interesting. It's the most interesting language. I'm going to get killed when my colleagues see this on YouTube. Um, it's the most interesting language because it's an isolate. It has no family relatives, living or dead, right? And that it, it's very interesting in terms of world typology. Um, but it's, we understand it primarily because ancient scribes translated Sumerian into the other language that I'm going to use ref reference several times tonight, which is Akkadian. And Akkadian is a language that's in the Semitic language family, so it's closely related to languages like Hebrew and Arabic, so we understand it relatively well. Now, I mentioned that uh, the Sumerian flood tablet wasn't quite that anymore. Um, there's a couple of new pieces in the last few years. Uh, this is uh, still an emerging field. One is this piece, which uh, probably came out of the ground in the 19th century and was brought in to be assessed by a keeper in the British Museum named Irving Finkel, who's a very smart guy, understood immediately what it was, um, and has christened it the Ark Tablet. And you can read Irving's book, um, called The Ark Before Noah, uh, which is a great book, which will tell you a huge amount about the tablet and about the flood story and about things like where we think the ark might have thought to have come to rest and so forth. Um, for me, I'm going to reference it here because it's clearly aligned with, if not part of, the Atrahasis story. And it actually gives us a little bit more technical detail on how to build an ark if we should need to. <laughs> Uh, this piece has not yet been uh, properly edited and translated, so I won't actually use it today. You can actually read quite a lot from the photo. Um, this is unfortunately a piece of the antiquities market. Um, we are not uh, quite as beset by those pieces as you might think, but there certainly are you know, hundreds of them. Uh, this is certainly a part of a flood story which will be published by Conrad Falk in the collection of a, a collector in Norway called uh, Skin, Martin Skin. And this, um, this is a brilliant piece of work um, by a former student here, a former student of mine, I'm proud to say, uh, Jeremy Peterson, who worked on a project um, to, to create an online repository of materials about Ur, and in doing so worked on all the literary fragments from Ur and you can see they're quite small fragments in some cases. And one of Jeremy's brilliance is, is that he goes through drawers full of small fragments and joins them to bigger fragments or other small fragments, uh, which he did with the Nippur tablets here. And he's done it with this. And it's another version of the Sumerian flood story from Ur. And we sort of knew about one of the pieces of it, but he's actually been able to recover now some uh, extremely important fragmentary lines which show who the first king created by the gods was. And we'll come back to that later. So the flood, you know, flood studies, I guess, uh, is a, a, an ongoing thing. And here's our The Sumerian Flood Tablet. Um, we called it The Sumerian Flood Tablet because although there are a number of versions of flood in Akkadian, until recently there were no others in Sumerian. And in fact, its pedigree is a little bit suspect, um, by which I don't mean it's a fake, um, but there are those who think that maybe it's actually a Sumerian text that was written by somebody who knew the Akkadian text to create a Sumerian flood story. Uh, I think that's a lot less likely now, actually, now that we have the Ur piece. It, I mean, it shows that there were other versions of the Ur, of the flood story in existence. So interestingly, the Sumerian piece has a few Akkadian words written on it. So, I mean, the Ur piece. So... It's time to tell you some stories, right? That's what I like to do in these talks. Um, I'm going to sort of go through a collection of flood elements because one of the points I'm going to make is that in Mesopotamia, probably nowhere, in fact, uh, it's never just about the flood. It's the flood in a context. You have some kind of pre-flood or creation or something like that. Then you have the flood, and then you have something that happens afterwards. You have the aftermath, yeah? So this is not quite the start 
of the uh, Sumerian flood story, though it is the start of this tablet. You can see this is the top edge here. Yeah. Um, and it starts off, the gods created humanity. Very nice. And the animals were multiplying below altogether. They made livestock and quadrupeds as fitting things in the step. In the high step, they somethinged joyous plants everywhere. There's a missing verb. At that time, the canal was not dug. This is very common in Sumerian creation stories. Sumerian uh, literature doesn't do very well at describing something you can't imagine. That is, the world before civilization and creation. So the way they describe creation is, or pre-creation rather, is as a negation of everything they're used to, right? Uh, the canals were not dug, like, the ditch were not dredged, there were no snakes, there were no scorpions, no lions, no hyenas, the dog and wolf were not present. So this is before life as we knew it, is how this tablet starts off, right? And then in the break, uh, the piece that I'm not giving in full, uh, they create and assign the first cities to gods, and this is also in the, the pen, the Sumerian flood tablet. And on the reverse, when we pick up again, uh, among those cities, Eridu, which is the city of the god Enki Ea, the god of wisdom and magic, they established as the leader, probably. When you see words in italics in my translations, it means that we're not quite certain um, that that's what was there, uh, either because we don't understand the word or because there's a break, maybe. Um, but it's pretty clear that it has something to do with kingship. They led a man who was lying, maybe, among its widespread teeming people. An, Enlil, and Enki, the fathers of the gods, chose Alulim for the shepherdship of the entirety of the teeming people. They called that name Alulim. Um, my translation is based on Jeremy's, but it's not quite the same. Uh, sumerologists always disagree on translations. It's a matter of principle with us. Um, <laughs> So Alulim is the first known king in the Sumerian king list, and I'll come back to that. So this is fantastic. We didn't know this before, right? And for us, that's really exciting. I can, I can see you're having a difficult time following my excitement, <laughs> but believe me, it's really exciting, okay? Trust me. So now let's look at Ashrahazis. Ashrahazis is fascinating because it's such an extensive account, as I said, by one person. And Ashrahazis begins with something that you know, may have been in the Sumerian flood story as well. We just don't have those pieces. Um, the very first words are, when the gods like man. That's how it was known in antiquity, by the first words. When the gods like man. Did the work, bore the loads. The gods' load was too great. They worked too, the work too hard, the trouble too much. The great Anunnaki, that's a collective term for the, the higher gods, made the Igigi, which is a collective term for the lower gods, carry the workload sevenfold. Seven's a magic number in Mesopotamia. You're going to see lots of sevens this evening. And I'm not here to tell the Atrahasis story today, um, but I, maybe I could another time if I got invited back. Um, but to cut a long story short, the gods don't like this. They don't like the sweat and the toil. You can't blame them, really, right? Um, and so they rebel, and there's a god called Allah, no relation to Islamic Allah. I realized as I was typing it that I should be clear about that. Uh, who is a ringleader for them. And this, the text continues. So here, by the way, I said I would explain a bit as we went along. This tablet has four columns. It would have originally been a perfect rectangle along there. So there's column one. This is the very start of the text in the top left. There's column two. It's column three and column four. And then when it turns over, it's got another four columns on the back. So we number those columns one through eight. And you'll see that I have tried to put the column numbers in Roman and the, the line numbers in Arabic script. Um, so you can sense how much of a gap there is. So I, I've skipped over all of this, basically, and we're around here somewhere, right, on the tablet. So the gods listened to Allah's speech, set fire to their tools, put aside their spades for fire, their loads for the god, fire god. They flared up when they reached the gate of warrior Enlil's dwelling. It was night, the middle watch, the house was surrounded. The god, Enlil, had not realized it. He had no idea what, he, what was coming to for him. Villagers with pitchforks, basically, right? <laughs> 
And so after this slightly awkward scene, um, you know, a fair bit of rebellion passes. Obviously, the major gods don't get killed. It gets uh, dealt with. Um, but they make a deal. They say, OK, we understand the minor gods don't want to do all the hard labor. We've got an idea. We'll create humanity to do the hard labor. So now you know why every day is such a challenge, right? <laughs> it, was, it was meant to be, OK? And so one of the important aspects of Atrahasis actually is the creation of humanity. Again, not something I'm going to dwell on in detail uh, today, but a little bit. Um, so Belit Ili, I bring her in because she comes back after the flood. You'll see her in a few minutes. The womb goddess is present. Let the womb goddess create offspring and let man bear the load of the gods. This is the point, right? They called her up and said, create humanity. And Nintu, all these different words for the, for the same goddess, Mami and Nintu and Bele Ili. They like to be scholarly and show off in all these fancy words. Nintu made her voice heard and spoke to the great gods. It is not proper for me to make him. The work is Enki's. That's the god of magic and wisdom. He makes everything pure. If he gives me clay, then I will do it. And that's what happens. They set up this system. They nip off pieces of clay and create seven women and seven men. And humanity is created. Okay? And they do the work of the gods. And they're extremely successful. Problem is, they're too successful. Um, when these catastrophes happen in Atrahasis, it's clear that they happen not because humans did anything really wrong, but because there were too many of them and they were too noisy. And there's a reason for this, which we'll come to towards the end of the talk. So 600 years, less than 600 passed, and the country became too wide, the people too numerous. The country was as noisy as a bellowing bull. The god Enlil grew restless at their racket. Enlil had to listen to their noise. And he said to the great gods, I can't sleep. The humanity is so noisy. Right? You know, if you have, if you have or if you've had children, you know, you, you sympathize to some extent. Right? But not with the next bit. Not supposed to sympathize with the next bit. Give the order that Surupu disease shall break out. So then for this tablet, the rest of this tablet, and the whole of Tablet 2 and some of Tablet 3, what happens in Atrahasis is there's a series of attempts by Enlil to wipe out humanity. And each attempt is thwarted. And the first one, this is at the end of, of Tablet 1. So on the, on the uh, other side of this, down on this part of the tablet somewhere, in comes Atrahasis. Now, there was one Atrahasis whose ear was open to his god Enki. The ear is very important because the ear in Sumerian, uh, Nyeshtug, um, is actually one of the seats of wisdom. And if you are broad of ear or open of ear, you understand things. And particularly what you understand is the ways of the god. And Atrahasis, which means exceedingly wise, means exceedingly wise in a specific way, which is that he knows how he needs to behave towards Enki Ea. And that's why he gets selected to be the flood survivor. Right? So that does align in some way, but without quite the same overtones of righteousness with why Noah is the flood survivor in the biblical story and why Nuh is the flood survivor in the Quranic version. Yeah? And Enki tells him how to deal with the, the, uh, the disease and with other plagues and storms and so forth, and ultimately with the flood. The flood version in Atrahasis is very, very similar to the one in Gilgamesh in most of its points. I'm not going to do it in detail because I'm going to go through the Gilgamesh one in detail in a few minutes. Um, but I want to dally for a second on the flood survivor. So the flood survivor in the Sumerian flood tablet is called Zia Sudra which is a very nice name. Uh, Z means life, and Ud means day, and Sudr in Sumerian means to be remote or far off. And it, in, there's a part of the Mesopotamian conception of mortality that we all have a day on which we're going to die. And in the Assyrian royal inscriptions, they gloat when they kill their enemies prematurely, and they say, I made him die on a day that wasn't his. Right? I made him die a premature death. And Zia Sudra means one who has a life with a far off day. Yeah? He's not going to die for a long, long time. And he's humble, committed, reverent. He's a priest. He has the same thing going on with Enki as Atrahasis, basically. And the flood survivor in Gilgamesh is called Udnapishti, which means finder of life. 
And uh, the flood frame in Gilgamesh is not as extensive because in Gilgamesh, it's arrived at really via Gilgamesh's travels and he reaches the end of the world and meets Utnapishti. But when Utnapishti first starts to tell him the flood story, he says, let me disclose, O Gilgamesh, a matter most secret. To you I will tell a mystery of the gods. And the mystery is the flood story. And in Gilgamesh, to anticipate what I'm going to say by the end of the talk, the flood is bound up with knowledge. So the Ark tablet, how do you build an Ark? Well, you can read Irving's book. I didn't uh, bring out an extensive quote here, and I won't spend the time to read it in detail. Um, but you can see, just as I talk, uh, there are specifics about the amount of bitumen you'll need, about the number of stanchions. Uh, Irving argues fairly convincingly that uh, the Ark has the form, in this text at least, of a large coracle, or guffa, which is a, a kind of a flat, round boat that they use in Mesopotamia. Um, so this is all that's on the tablet, basically. I mean, there's a few other important things. Um, but now I really want to spend some time and tell the story of the Gilgamesh flood. Um, so this is going to be based on Gilgamesh Tablet 11, highly abridged. It's about 300 lines in total, the whole tablet, about 200 of the flood story. Um, the tablets are from, as I said, Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh. And I've illustrated it with uh, artworks um, representing aspects of the imagined deluge. Because one of the great things about the alignment of the biblical flood story with the Mesopotamian one is that you have all these fantastic images. Uh, you don't have Mesopotamian ones. They didn't ever make a single picture of the flood story. That Well, tomorrow there'll be one in the press. But not, not, that, not that we know of yet, okay? So, Utnapishtim talks to Gilgamesh, who's arrived from this long journey, and he's, as you, some of you know, he's defeated the monster Huwawa, and his friend Enkidu has died, and he's gone on this long quest following the death of his friend Enkidu, because he wants to be immortal, basically. And he arrives at Utnapishtim's uh, dwelling, really at the end of the earth, and Utnapishtim tells him the story of you know, how the gods decided to destroy humanity and how Ea or Enki tipped him off. Um, Ea was expressly forbidden to talk directly to the flood survivor, so he talked to the wall. Uh, that's what this thing was about here. Wall, wall, read wall, read wall. It's a great trick, right? So Enki talks to the wall, and the wall reflects it through the flood survivor. Um, and then Udnapishtim sort of settles in and tells the actual story of the core of the flood. He says, the weather to look at was full of foreboding. I went into the boat and sealed my hatch. To the one who sealed the boat, Puzor Enlil, the shipwright, I gave my palace with all its good. It always strikes me that that's questionable, generos questionable generosity. <laughs> uh, it's all going to be wiped out in 10 minutes, but here, have it. Um, at the very first glimmer of brightening dawn, there rose on the horizon a dark cloud of black. And bellowing within it was Adad, the storm god. The Anunnaki, those are the, remember the important gods, carried torches of fire, scorching the country with brilliant flashes. The stillness of the storm god passed over the sky, and all that was bright turned into darkness. For a day the gales flattened the country, quickly they blew, and then came the deluge. Even the gods took fright of the deluge. They left and went up to the heaven of Anu, lying like dogs, curled up in the open. Sweet-voiced Belet Ili wailed, the olden times have turned to clay. It's a complete reversion, right? Humans come from clay and they've been returned to clay. Because I spoke evil in the God's assembly. How could I speak evil in the God's assembly and declare a war to kill my people? It is I who gave birth, those people are mine. And now, like fish, they fill the ocean. For six days and seven nights, there blew the wind, the downpour, the gale, the deluge, it flattened the land. But the seventh day when it came, the gale relented, the deluge ended. The ocean that had thrashed like a woman in labor grew calm, the tempest grew still, the deluge ended. I looked at the weather, says Utnapishtim. It's hard to remember he's speaking, right? It's all first person narrative. I looked at the weather. It was quiet and still, but all the people had turned to clay. 
On the mountain of Nemush, the boat ran aground. Mount Nemush held the boat fast, allowed it no motion. The seventh day after that, I brought out a dove, let it loose. Off went the dove, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so back it came to me. I brought out a swallow, back it came to me. I brought out a raven. Finding food, it did not come back to me. Ring some bells? I brought out an offering to the four winds I made sacrifice, incense I placed on the peak of the mountain. Seven flasks and seven, there's that magic number again, I set in position. Reed, cedar, and myrtle, I piled beneath them, traditional purifiers. The gods did smell the savor, the gods did smell the savor sweet. The gods gathered like flies around the man making sacrifice. The gods depend on humanity for their food. They created humanity, do their labor, and to feed them. So destroying humanity, not the smartest thing to do, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> then at once, Belatili arrived. She lifted the flies of lapis lazuli that Anu had made for their courtship. She has a necklace of flies. We actually find them archeologically, little tiny lapis lazuli flies. Oh gods, let these great beads in this necklace of mine make me remember these days and never forget them. They don't want to do this again, right? Memorial. All the gods shall come to the incense, but to the incense let Enlil not come. Enlil has caused this problem because he lacked counsel and brought on the deluge and delivered my people into destruction. And then towards the end of the narrative, Enlil says, in the past, Utnapishti was a mortal man, but now he and his wife shall become like us gods. Utnapishti shall dwell far away where the rivers flow forth. This is not a gift, this is a punishment, right? He's being removed from society, yeah? So far away they took me and settled me where the rivers flow forth. So since I put aftermath in my title, I felt I should address it, um, even though the flood is really the high spot, right? So what I wanna do in the last few minutes is bring out several different ways in which these flood stories get larger meanings. On the one hand, they're great stories, right? So for Gilgamesh, there's two big issues here. One is immortality, or the futility of his search for immortality. Immediately after, Utnapishtim finishes and says, they told me to live where the rivers flow forth. He says, but now who'll convene for you the assembly of the gods? So you can find the life you search for. For six days and seven nights, come, do without slumber. So what the Pishtim's challenge is, it took the flood to get me immortality, and it took the assembly of the gods to get me immortality, and he says, essentially, I bet you can't even stay awake for the period of the flood, six days and seven nights. And some of you remember in the story, um, Udna Pishtim asks his wife to make bread and put it by Gilgamesh uh, every day because no sooner has Gilgamesh said, oh, sure, I can do that, than he falls asleep, <laughs> right? And they put seven loaves of bread. And then when he wakes up on the seventh day, he says, I was just resting my eyes. Right? We all do it. But there is the bread in various stages of decay and mold and rotting and dried out. Right? So they, so they make the passage of time concrete through the rotting bread. So Gilgamesh fails to get immortality. Um, but the other big thing in Gilgamesh, um, which I'm going to take the liberty of not describing in a huge amount of detail because you can actually look at the Great Journeys YouTube video that I did, uh, where I do discuss it at, I must say, somewhat embarrassing length, um, is the return of knowledge. Because there's an, a Mesopotamian understanding of the fact that when the flood occurred and humanity was wiped out, and the one survivor was a very close follower of Enki or Ea, he had the knowledge of Enki and Ea, Enki Ea, but he was basically banished. So all of the religious knowledge, the cult knowledge, went with him, right? And Gilgamesh is actually credited with, with, with bringing it back. Uh, so at the start of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it says, he who saw the deep, the foundation of the country, uh, who knew the proper ways, was wise in everything, saw the deep, knew the proper ways. He ex everywhere explored the seats of power. He knew the sum of wisdom about everything. He saw the secret and uncovered the hidden. 
He brought back intelligence from before the flood. That's one expression of it. In an earlier Sumerian tale of Gilgamesh, uh, called actually the death of Gilgamesh, in the, Mesopot in the uh, later Gilgamesh epic, Gilgamesh doesn't die, Enkidu dies, but in the Sumerian tales in 18th century BC, there is one about the death of Gilgamesh. And when Gilgamesh is dying, he gets all depressed and says, don't feel I've done anything. And he gets called in a dream before the assembly of the gods and says, look at all the things you've done, the gods say to him. And one of the things they say he's done after he's arrived at the assembly of the gods, they say in, in bold, having founded many temples of the gods, you reached Ziyasudra in his dwelling place, having brought down to the land the divine powers of Sumer, which at that time were forgotten forever. They're very explicit a thousand years earlier in the Sumerian version. The orders, the rituals, the rites, you carried out correctly the rites of hand washing. So part of the aftermath of the flood is the loss of knowledge, but it's recovered by Gilgamesh's activity. So for the Sumerian version, it's a little harder to understand what the aftermath involves um, because the tablets are still too broken, but there's every hope of, as you can see, finding more. Um, but thanks to uh, the new piece from Ur, we do have a clearer idea of how closely that account aligns with several other documents, only one of which I'm going to talk about here. And the one I'm going to talk about is the Sumerian king list, which is uh, best known from this eight-column, four-sided prism in Oxford, known as the Weld Blundell prism. Um, and the king list is about, surprisingly, kingship, right? And clearly, kingship or shepherdship is one of the concerns of the flood story. And it reiterates that notion that things are restored afterwards and things continue. And it does so because in the antediluvian section, which is not in all versions of the king list and is probably deliberately aligned with the flood story, this is not accidental, uh, kingship descended from heaven. Kingship was in Eridu. So in the flood story, Eridu is the prime city. In Eridu, Alulim became king, right? So there's the same tradition in two different contexts, which for sure are derived from the same people's thought processes. And these kings have, let, let's not be unkind and say absurd reigns, but let's say they have remarkably long reigns, right? <laughs> so Alulim reigned for 28,800 years, Al-Algar ruled for 36,000 years. Uh, it goes on in Shurapak, down here, Ubartutu became king. In one of the references in the Akkadian flood stories, uh, Atrahasis is called the son of Ubar, Ubartutu. So he's thought of as a son of the last king before the flood in some contexts. And then the flood swept over. It says quite simply, after the floods had swept over and the kingship had descended from heaven, the kingship was in Kish, a new order. So the flood in this context is like a big erasure in time, right? Before it, you have these kings with very, very long reigns, and after it, you have kings with still long reigns, but, but less remarkable, perhaps. And finally, Atrahasis. The aftermath and context in Atrahasis are different again, and both interesting and frustrating, um, because we don't quite have the text preserved all the way to the end, but we have enough to see what's going on. So at the end, in columns uh, six and seven, end of six and seven, of tablet three, which is this one up there, uh, Enlil is making more declarations, and he says, come, summon Nintu the womb goddess, confer with each other in the assembly. Enki made his voice heard, Enki Eya, and spoke to the womb goddess Nintu, you are the womb goddess who decrees destinies to the people. Let one third of them be something, something broken, ugh. Let another third of them be something. And in addition, this is, the, this is where we get to understand what's going on here. In addition, let there be one third of the people among the people, the women who gives birth, but does not give birth successfully. Let there be the Pashitu demon among the people to snatch the baby from its mother's lap. Establish Ugbabtu, Entu, and Egesitu women. They shall be taboo, that is, they won't have children for religious reasons, and thus control childbirth. So what happens at the end of Atrahasis, 
you think back to what I was saying at the beginning of it, the big problem with Atrahasis is the gods don't want to do the work, they create humans to do the work, the humans are extremely successful, probably because the gods forgot to make them mortal. So they multiply uncontrolledly. And by the end of Atrahasis, they're not saying, let's wipe out humanity anymore, because you know, you'd also depend on them to do your work, to build the temples, and the temples are where you live and where you get fed if you're a god. But they are saying, let's have mortality and let's have some kind of pub, uh, population control measures, right? So this is Uruk. We're back like Gilgamesh to Uruk and safety. Um, and to sum up, uh, just what I've been saying for the last little while. Uh, the flood story is a fantastic element in a number of stories in its own right. But those narratives really only get meaning when you look at them in context. When you look at them in context, they're always part of a cycle which involves a series of events of creation, destruction, and recreation. And it's one that's paralleled not only on the apocalyptic scale, which is really a one-off in a sense, right? But then in fact, it gets aligned in Sumerian literary texts, for example, with the kinds of destructions that happen when invaders come in and flatten and create environments like the flood and then go away and you rebuild. So it becomes almost a metaphor for the way humans live. Thank you.